starting right away with problem 2.10, we're asked to first off construct the second excited state for the harmonic oscillator. Uh, we already have the first excited state, so let's write that out first. We know that psi 1 of x, which we calculated in example 2.4, is equal to m omega over pi h bar to the power of 1 fourth times the square root of 2m omega over h bar multiplied by x times e to the negative m omega over 2h bar x squared. And we also know that to get psi 2, uh, we just have to apply uh, the raising operator a hat plus onto psi 1. And uh, we also know that the raising operator will sort of knock off the normalization of psi 2. So what we actually have is that to get psi 2, uh, this is going to be equal to the a2 normalization constant multiplied by a hat plus times psi 1 where a2 is going to be determined by sort of the coefficients that we define generally uh, for raising and lowering operators way back in example 2.4. Uh, but before we actually go about finding a2, let's start by just finding what a hat plus on psi 1 actually does. So uh, we know that a hat plus is going to be equal to 1 over the square root of 2 h bar m omega multiplied by negative i hat, or i times p hat, apologies. i itself is not the operator, it's p that's the operator, plus m omega, and then x hat is just equal to x, so plus m omega x. Uh, if we want to do this, if we want to rewrite this in terms of just purely x, we can define p hat to be equal negative i h bar d by dx, in which case this becomes the exact same constant at the front, this time. Okay, so p hat is, let's see, p hat is negative i times h bar d by dx. So the two negatives turn into a positive, i times i makes a second negative, so this is negative h bar d by dx plus m omega x. And we're acting this on our psi one wave function. So we're going to act this on psi one. So let's see, uh, let's move. So let's write out the constants. First, we have m omega over pi h bar to the power of one fourth. And then we have the square root of two m omega over h bar. And then we're multiplying this by x times e to the negative m omega over 2 h bar times x squared, where this entire thing is equal to psi 1. So let's rearrange and move all of the constants onto the left side and try to get this in actual terms. So uh, first things first, uh, we have square root of 2 m omega at the top and square root of 2 m omega at the bottom. So this automatically cancels out. Uh, we have the h bar square root at the bottom and the h bar square root at the bottom here and here. So those just make one over h bar. Let's put it one over h bar. And then we're multiplying by this one fourth term, m times omega over pi h bar to the power of one fourth. Uh, and then we're having negative h bar d by dx plus m omega x acting on our x e to the negative m omega over 2 h bar x squared. Okay, uh, this is just a constant, so we can just ignore it for now and focus on solving sort of this term over here. Let's split this into parts. So this is going to be negative h bar times d by dx of x times e to the negative m omega 
over 2 h bar times x squared. And then plus m omega x squared times e to the negative m omega over 2 h bar oops, times x squared. Okay, uh, this is just sort of a chain rule derivative. So this is become this is going to become negative h bar times. Let's see, uh, d by dx of x is just one, so we have e to the negative m omega over two h bar x squared, added with x times the derivative of this e term, which is going to give us negative m omega over h bar times x times e to the negative m omega over 2 h bar x squared. And this whole thing is added with m omega x squared e to the negative m omega 2 h bar x squared. So instantly, uh, what we see here is that we can move this exponential term out and derive it out. Uh, so let's do that. So let's start by distributing out this exponential. So e to the negative m times omega over 2 h bar times x squared. And then we're going to multiply this. So the negative h goes in. So we have negative h bar. Uh, let's see. This is a negative. Uh, this is also a negative. Those things cancel out. The h bars cancel out at the top and bottom. So this becomes uh, plus m omega x squared and then we have another plus m omega x squared due to this term right here close off this bracket add like terms uh, this becomes e to the negative m omega over 2 h bar times x squared multiplied by 2 m omega x squared subtracted by h bar. And then we want to move sort of this con these constants at the front on as well. So let's do this. Let's add the constant. So it's 1 over h bar times m omega over pi fourth, pi h bar to the 1 fourth. So 1 over h bar times m omega over pi h bar, all to the power of 1 fourth, multiplied by this exponential. Let me just make sure that that's correct. Yes. Okay, so this is what applying our raising operator onto psi 1 gives us. Uh, the next thing we need to do is we actually need to find sort of the A2 normalization constant that we defined up above here. So to do that, uh, we go back to example 2.4 and the fact that we sort of derived out a general rule for how the a hat plus and minus operators actually denormalize uh, successive functions. Uh, we know that a hat plus acting on psi n is going to give us uh, psi of n plus one, but multiplied by this factor cn, which sort of causes normalization to get shifted out. Uh, so to actually renormalize this, we need to multiply by uh, so in the case of uh, so in the case of cn, uh, cn is equal to or cn squared magnitude cn squared is equal to m plus one. So in the case of going from one to two, we have a hat plus acting on psi one becomes equal to and since n equals one, then we have two. So cn is going to be root two. So we have root two multiplied by psi of n plus one. So if psi n plus one has to be normalized, then uh, we want our a2 term to be the reciprocal of cn. So a2 actually equals one over square root of two. So then we just apply, we sort of just attach that on to here. And what we get is that psi two is equal to one over h bar root two, and then multiplied by everything else that we've sort of defined here which is this entire thing. And with that, we have uh, sort of finished uh, the first part of this problem.
uh, parts B and C sort of go hand in hand, so let's do them both at the same time. Uh, part B wants us to sketch Psi 0, 1, and 2. Uh, we already know Psi 0 and Psi 1. Uh, psi 0 we solved for while we were doing this section uh, about sort of the algebraic method. Uh, psi 1 we solved in example 2.4, and Psi 2 we just solved right now. Um, and then sketching this is just sort of a matter of plugging this into like Desmos, for example, and getting an answer. So I've already done that here. Uh, and we have Psi 0 in red, which is the ground state. We have the first excited state, Psi 1 in black. And then we have the uh, Psi 2 in blue. So there's not really that much to say about this. So let's just go straight to part three, uh, which is the check explicitly via integration that Psi 0, Psi 1, and Psi 2 are in fact orthogonal. And we have a hint here and it's to exploit the evenness and oddness of the functions. So first off, uh, what do we mean by checking orthogonality via explicit integration? So uh, earlier on when we were, I think it was back in 2.1 when we were talking about sort of, uh, no, it wasn't back, it wasn't 2.1, it might've been even earlier, but there was a point earlier uh, to, to, to sort of summarize, there was a point earlier where we were talking about how stationary states are complete. And what we mean by that is that uh, it's actually possible to create any arbitrary function uh, that is sort of a uh, linear combination of individual stationary states. So uh, in the case of a harmonic oscillator, for example, we could say that any function f was actually equal to like sort of a summation uh, in index by n starting from, you know, the ground state at zero all the way to infinity of coefficients cn multiplied by each individual stationary state psi n. And one of the requirements for something like this to be possible is that psi n has to be effectively, uh, it has to be orthogonal. And what we mean that by that is that any integral from negative infinity to positive infinity uh, of psi n psi m, or in this case, psi n star psi m dx has to equal the Dirac delta of n m. And what that means is that if n equals m, then this is just a magnitude squared of a psi, and since it's normalized and it's a probability distribution, then it can only equal one. Uh, but if n doesn't equal m, then it has to equal zero. Uh, and what part c is asking us to do is, it's asking us to prove this uh, for zero, one, and two. So what we have to do technically is uh, we have to plug in n equals zero, m equals one. We have to, we have to check that psi one star times psi zero or psi zero star times psi one because the complex conjugates are equal in this case since these are all real functions uh we have to check that that integral equals zero we have to do the same for zero to two we have to do the same thing for one to two so we're being asked to do three different integrals zero one uh zero two and one two effectively uh however uh the hint here says that we can exploit what's called evenness and oddness of functions and that reduces our work from having to do three integrals, 0, 1, 1, 2, and 0, 2, to so just one integral. And uh, what we mean by that, as sort of a quick review of even and odd functions, is that uh, given some integral going from negative a to a, given some symmetric integral of some function f of x dx, if f is even, then this does not necessarily equal zero gen in general. However, if f of x is odd, this always equals zero. So the requirement for this integral to equal zero is that f of x is odd. And the reason why this happens is that for an odd function, uh, sort of as we go, like everything, no matter what the function behaves like for positive x, the lower side is sort of just like an even mirror copy of it. So if we're doing an integral, which is just adding everything, so an integral from like negative a to positive a, for example, takes all of the elements uh, of the function either above or below the line, and we add them together. And since these are symmetrical, what we get is that the positive integral from zero to a is going to give some positive constant, let's call it big A. And the integral from negative a to zero is gonna give that same constant, but it's a negative instead of a positive. So uh, what that means is that any symmetric integral of an odd function is always going to equal zero, regardless of what form the function actually takes. Uh, we also have the fact that multiplying an odd function with an even function results in an odd function. And 
multiplying an odd function with an odd function gives an even function, whereas an even and even gives an even function. So it sort of uh, follows the same sort of train of logic as negatives. Multiplying two negatives gives a positive. Multiplying a positive with a negative gives a negative. And in this case, odds take on sort of the rule of negatives, while evens take on the role of, e of positive numbers. So uh, what we can do here is we can see from these graphs that psi 1, or psi naught, is actually even, because it's symmetrical about the y-axis. Uh, we can see that psi 1 is odd, because it's anti-symmetrical. Uh, if you look here, uh, the positive takes on this form, and then the negative side takes on the exact opposite, basically just reflected over the x-axis. We also know that psi 2 is even, just from sort of looking at these graphs. So psi 2 is also symmetrical about the y-axis. So the integral, uh, so in when we're looking at these kinds of integrals, if we're going from 0, 1, so if n equals 0 and m equals 1, or if it's the other way around, it's the same thing, uh, it's an even and odd function multiplied together, which gives us an odd function. So automatically, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of psi 0 star times psi 1 dx is automatically equal to 0. So we don't have to worry about the 0, 1 transition. Same thing going from 1 to 2. 1 is an odd function, 2 is an even function. Their product is going to be an odd function. So the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of psi 1 star psi 2 dx is also going to be exactly equal to 0. So because of that, as this hint said, there's actually only one integral that we have to do or that we have to verify equals 0, and it's this transition going from 0 to 2, because these are both even functions. So uh, let's write this out. I'll start by copy-pasting this all the way down here. I'll delete the psi 1, because we don't care about that one. Move psi 2 up to the top. All right, so first off, uh, what we care about is the integral equaling 0. So all of these sort of constants at the front we can just ignore. So what we really have is the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then we get rid of all these constants at the front. So we're left with, let's see, uh, this exponential term gets squared. So this becomes e to the negative m omega over h bar instead of over 2h bar times x squared. And then we're multiplying by this extra term, 2m omega x squared minus h bar. OK, uh, let's sort of distribute this out fully. So this is going to give us an integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of, uh, let's see, 2m omega x squared times e the negative m omega over h bar times x squared dx, and we're subtracting this by an integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of h bar times e to the negative m omega over h bar x squared dx. And instantly, we see that these are Gaussian integrals. Uh, we have covered how to solve these in problem 1.3, so I encourage you to look back if you don't remember. However, uh, it turns out that in this case, we actually don't have to solve them. Everything will cancel out very nicely. Uh, the most difficult part of this is actually manipulating this first integral into something that looks like this integral via u sub. So let's do that right now. So uh, what we can do here is we can sort of take advantage of the fact that uh, the the derivative d by dx of this exponential of e to the negative m omega over h bar times x squared is equal to negative 2m omega over h bar times x, and then multiplied by that same exponent, so e to the negative m omega over h bar times x squared. So what we can do is we can say, OK, uh, if I do, so h by h bar multiplied by d by dx is just equal of e to the negative m. Well, let's just copy paste this to save time. Uh, first off, delete this. 
So if I multiply h bar onto this derivative of exponential, I get that this is just equal to negative 2m omega x and then times this e term. And if we look up at our first term in our integral, that's exactly what we have here. We have 2m omega and then we have x squared multiplied by the same exponential. So there's nothing stopping us from sort of taking this first integral right here and rewriting it as the, uh, hang on, I need to make my canvas a little bit larger. Oh, I can't, it's maxed out. Okay, let's, uh, let's make it wider instead. Oops. Okay, well, my canvas is glitching, so let's just rewrite this out again. Uh, this is going to be equal to omega, and then x multiplied by this exponential. Okay, so we can take, we can take this integral here, and we can rewrite it, and let's do it like over here. We can rewrite it as the integral from negative infinity to infinity, and we're gonna move this x out, and we're gonna, so this is gonna actually be equal to negative h bar x multiplied by d by dx of e, the negative m omega over h bar times x squared. So what we've done is we've sort of rewritten the 2m omega x times e, and we've moved the other x out to the left, and we replace the 2m omega x e term with this. So that's where the negative h bar comes from, is because we want to get the negative in order to cancel out the negative here. So once we get this form, uh, we can actually use integration by parts. We can say uh, that we can use u, uh, u sub effectively, uh, or not u sub, integration by parts by setting u to be equal to, uh, let's see, yeah, we'll set u to be equal to negative h bar x. So that means du is going to be equal to negative h bar dx. Then we set dv to be equal to this derivative term. So d by dx of this whole thing. My canvas is running out of space again. Okay, uh, my canvas is being difficult, so we're going to just have to squeeze this in instead manually. Uh, this is going to be equal to the derivative of the exponential of negative m omega over h bar x squared dx. So that means the integral v is just going to be equal to the exponential itself, e to the negative m omega over h bar times x squared. So if we write this out, we have uh, uv. So we can write this out as uv minus integral v du. Uh, instantly, uh, we should see that this exponential, uh, as x goes to negative infinity, infinity, this is a negative exponential, so it goes to zero exponentially, versus like this h bar x, which just goes to zero linearly. So uh, the boundary term ends up canceling out because v goes to zero as we go to negative infinity, infinity, uh, much quicker compared to this u term. So the uv evaluated at positive infinity and negative infinity automatically cancels to zero. So this is going to be uv minus integral v du. And we see that the uv term cancels out automatically. So we just have the negative of the integral of v du. So negative integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of v du. Well, there's a negative here. So the negative in du cancels out with the negative over here. And we get a positive term. And what do we have? We have uh, du is just h bar. So we have, oops, let's write this in red. We have h bar times 
e to the negative m omega over h bar x squared dx. And this is what sort of this first integral term simplifies to. So if we move this back to here, then what we see is that these two terms are exactly the same. They will cancel out and therefore this whole thing is just going to go and equal zero. So therefore this integral equals zero and we've proved that sort of the psi naught to psi two integral uh, is orthogonal as well. Uh, whereas sort of going from zero to one and going from one to two, we've shown that they are zero via the fact that sort of the resulting function is odd. And with that, we've finished this problem.